Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. It is time for me to review Shogun Episode 4, Eightfold Fins. So Episode 4 opens up with a messenger running through Izu. Is it called Izu? Why am I confused about that? I feel like sometimes they call it Izu and sometimes they call it Ajiro. Whatever. So there's a messenger running to Omi's house to deliver a message that his uncle's going to be coming to town and he's bringing Toronaga. So then we see the whole village scramble to get the village together for their arrival. Do you really imagine having to run outside your house and like make sure your lawn is neatly manicured and all the things? Because, so, you know what? Actually, we do do that, don't we? Our little individual cities will definitely clean up with like a governor's coming to town or the president's coming to town. Yeah, we do the same thing. The police will be out there cleaning up the homeless and stuff. Yeah, we do do that. Down in the galley, we see Mariko telling Fuji that she is now to become the consort to Blackthorn. Y'all already know how I feel about Fuji. I don't know why they're playing with my girl like this. I mean, I'm not a Blackthorn fan, but no part of me thought Blackthorn would be into it. So I wasn't too stressed out. But like that's as an outsider looking in. Fuji has no idea who that man is. Fuji doesn't know that he won't have any interest in being physical with her and for her to have just lost her son and her husband. You can tell that Fuji, she's feeling all the things in this moment, but she brings herself back down and actually tries to sympathize with Mariko's situation and the fact that Mariko just lost her husband. So Fuji just shows everything that she's feeling and everything that she wishes she could express she just shoves it down and you know what choice does she have she wants to become a nun but mariko says absolutely not you cannot become a nun this is your place tora naga wants her to do a year but mariko negotiates him down to six months so fuji must serve as consort to blackthorn the man who don't like to bathe, okay? That that European face, okay? We don't know that any of those women are into that. And he don't bathe. I don't think that we can lose sight of the fact that this man don't like to bathe. But like I said, this is all just gonna be fuel to her fire. All fuel to her fire for just the epic battle scene that I better get for my girl Fuji. Nagakato, Toranaga's son, lets it spill to Yabushige that someone should be looking to replace his father soon. And Yabushige is like, what, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And Toranaga overhears and he's like, well, yeah, I sent Hirumatsu to let them know that I've resigned. Yabushige is floored. He is shocked. Mouth agape. Like, what do you mean? Absolutely not. You're, you're not telling me this. I can't hear this. I cannot be hearing this right now. You've doomed us. Okay? You've pretty much just written all of our death warrants. You should kill yourself at once, bro. What? You've fed us all to the wolves. What are you doing? Like, what are you doing? You did what? Where am I? What reality am I living in right now? You said what? You did what? We're all dead. We're all dead at this point. You thought that was okay? I, I, I assume you'll be committing seppuku now, right? You gotta set this right. But Toranaga lets him know, I, I don't plan on make myself grow relax so they finally reach land and they are met with a fleet of yabushige's men yabushige sama yabushige sama how are you not the biggest narcissist in the world 
just a whole army of dudes just shit oh then megalomaniac and then we see omi reunite with blackthorn hilarious because omi cannot understand anything that blackthorn is saying and blackthorn's acting like he's being respectful but he's being a prick per usual we get to see toranaga greet all of yabushige's men and he gives an invigorating speech and it riles them all up and they go from shouting yabushige sama to toranaga sama he has his little fan and i need that fan it's like black and gold it's, it's beautiful and he's just being all oop say my name toranaga sama as they're shouting his name, Yabushige, he, you know, walks away towards the village and Toranaga's right behind him. Split second, Toranaga's in a boat. He's in a boat. He's in the water. And he's just waving to these hoes. Like, I'm not staying here. You thought I was going to stay here? I was never staying here. This was never part of the plan. I'm dropping y'all off here. I don't... I'm not staying here. You got me twisted. So after Toranaga leaves, we see Blackthorn searching for his men he's going around asking people if they've seen his men and oh what was his name what's the villager's name R moranji he runs into moranji and moranji you know his english isn't perfect so in japanese he tries to tell him your men have been taken somewhere safe but obviously blackthorn doesn't understand that um so blackthorn tries grabbing a boat and going towards his ship um, but I believe a soldier stops him. A soldier stops him, but he doesn't understand why he's being stopped. Mariko shows up and she explains to him, you unfortunately are not allowed to board your ship without permission. Obviously, he's not getting any kind of permission because Toranaga just floated his ass away. Blackthorn is obviously upset, rightfully upset. He thought this was going to go a completely different way than it's actually going. Next, Mariko takes him to the home that he will be staying in. It's very nice. He has servants and he has a consort. And he does not want Fuji as a consort. Which, if I were Fuji, I would have heard that and been completely relieved. And I was. I was totally relieved. I mean, I knew that was going to happen. Blackthorn doesn't give me that vibe. But either way, she's going to be there to help look after the house, look after the finances, and all that good stuff. Blackthorn, again, is understandably upset. He refuses all of it. He doesn't want it. He says that, you know, he came here on very clear terms, and he does not want to be playing these games. Mariko explains to him he doesn't have a choice, and she wants him to just be patient. I don't know if Mariko has an understanding of the world that Blackthorn comes from, even though it's not really all that relevant because that's not the world that they're currently living in and she needs to help him understand their world. But I'm sure having an understanding of where he comes from could help her help him, you know? <laughs> Mariko really does a fantastic job of helping him see you're in a completely different world, baby. You're in a completely different world. And this is how things run here in this world. And there's nothing you can do about it. You really need to just let go and ride the wave. Like, ride the wave, okay? Blackthorn acknowledges that he's still a prisoner, just in a nicer prison cell just with nicer living quarters and a stipend but that there's not much he can do about it and then we see Yabushige having drinks with his nephew and they strategize on how he can stay in the game I really think Omi's probably one of the smartest players in this game his uncle underestimates him because of his age I don't know how I don't know how old Omi is supposed to be but they make it seem like he's a child and they underestimate him a lot, but Omi, Omi is, Omi is that guy. Omi basically explains to him, look, the council can find a fifth regent. They can still vote on Toranaga's impeachment. This is not the end of the game for us. Nobody knows about this regiment that you're out here training. In the event that Toranaga is impeached and killed, 
these men are your men and you have that to offer Ishido. Like I can see it. Omi is a force to be reckoned with because he's the idea guy. He tends to come up with the ideas and he comes up with them quickly. Like he's a really fast thinker. He's quick on his feet. And even though the conversation started with his uncle doubting him, Obi was able to turn that around pretty quickly because of that ability that he has. Back at Blackthorn's place, we see him talking to Fuji, telling her, you can go, you don't have to stay here. But okay, for one, she can't understand you. She don't, it's breaking the Deutsch in, okay? And secondly, where's she gonna go? Where's she gonna go, Blackthorn? Then we have another situation with Mariko just trying to get through to Blackthorn and get him to understand their culture. Mariko ends up explaining her relationship to Fuji and how Fuji was her husband's niece. And she also explains to him what Fuji has just gone through. And Blackthorn is concerned for her. He's like, why is this what she's being required to do? She should be in mourning. And then he mentions he wouldn't think that she had just gone through all of this. And Mariko explains to him a concept in their culture called the Eightfold Fence. This is a coping mechanism that they are taught from a very, very young age. They are to steal up their minds and compartmentalize their emotions. So they still have their feelings, but their personal feelings and opinions have to be separate from their professional ones. So Mariko explains that to Blackthorn. Blackthorn looks very sad for them, but all he can do is try to understand. So even though it may not seem like the most glamorous position to hold in life, at least Fuji has a place and that's incredibly important. So the next morning, Omi pops up at Blackthorn's house and he's trying to take Blackthorn's guns. But Blackthorn not trying to give up his guns. Mariko is trying to translate and trying to defuse the situation because Blackthorn got his guns out. Like, I will pew pew you, sir. And it's just written all over his face. You can tell. Blackthorn is done. He's tired and feeling out of control. He is not used to this. He is a white man. He is a white man from Europe who is a pilot. He's used to freedom. He's used to being able to do whatever the hell he wants to do. It is written all over his face. He cannot handle this. Eventually, Fuji jumps in and she tells Mariko, hey, tell Blackthorn to give me the guts. Well, oh, Blackthorn's like, I'm absolutely not doing that. Mariko explains to him, look, Fuji is your consort. And if she's pledged to protect you and these guns, she will protect them with her life. You can trust her. Go ahead and give her the guns. He still hesitates, but then Fuji pops off at him. Fuji got to get in her irritated voice. Step all out of character for a cool, calm, and collected Fuji. She had to jump outside of herself and let him know, hand me these guns. Give me these guns, boy. Stop playing around. So that works. And he gives her the guns, as he should. And you see her pass one to one of the servants. And she keeps one. Omi then tries to step to Fuji and ask her to hand over the gun. Fuji. Tell y'all. We get to see a little bit of it. When she points that gun at Omi and lets him know he better leave her property a Lens. And don't forget, this is technically his property. He gave them a house. But Fuji put him right in his place and pointed that gun right in his face. They were more afraid of Fuji with them guns than Blackthorn. It was written all over their face. They wasn't scared. They was not scared of Blackthorn and his little guns. And he was holding two guns in their face. Fuji... Didn't even have her finger on the trigger. Fuji was holding the guns over her kimono. And they were terrified. As they should be. Fuji got a little look at her eye. I don't know if y'all notice. But Fuji be having a little look at her eye now. Now we see Blackthorn down at the training yard. I don't know what you would call it. But they're at their training area. And Blackthorn is stumbling over 
helping them with military tactics. He doesn't know anything about this. He's a sailor. It's like they keep forgetting that point. This man has never seen battle before. But after stumbling around for a while, he thinks of his strong suit, which is water. He's a sailor. He suggests that they load his ship with cannon. He's explaining to them how his cannon can reach these distances, but they are all skeptical because they say the Portuguese have tried this before and it didn't work. But they're all blown away when his cannon do exactly what he said they were going to do. So they are all geeked out of their minds about these cannons. They're having a great time. It is a boys party. Okay, Mariko's there. She's all proud of him. Then we see Mariko reading the translation, well, a partial translation of what was found in the Redders. We don't really know what's going on, but the little sentence that she reads or that we can catch on camera says something about burning to hell. Which is ominous. It doesn't sound good. Okay. Uh, but for some reason in the next scene that we see her in. The very next scene after reading that sentence. She's like smiling at Black Sword. Like girl what is you smiling at? So they're together and they're discussing more about the Catholic Church's involvement in all of this and Blackthorn is just trying to get Mariko to see the fault in these people. It hopes that she'll see them for who they really are. But then the earth gets to rocking and a quaking and a shaking. Blackthorn's terrified. He ain't never felt no sh like that before. He asks her girl what is that? And Mariko says a baby earthquake. What does it make? I live in California. And People are always, people who aren't from California are always, oh, I could never live in California because y'all got earthquakes, baby. What? I thought what we experienced was, I've never, I ain't never seen nothing jiggle on the table, nothing. I've lived in California my whole entire life, Southern and Northern, okay? My whole 38 years of life, okay? I've never, you don't, you don't, you don't notice it. Like you feel a little something, but girl, what she experienced as a baby earthquake? No, thank you. But this was another opportunity for Mariko to explain their way of thinking to Blackthorn. And this episode, you see a lot of her immersing him into their culture. You see a lot more of him practicing his Japanese and a lot more scenes of, you know, her just trying to explain their way to him. And after the earthquake, she explains to him, you know, this is why we build our houses the way that we build them because we want them to come down just as easily as we can build them back up. She says they experience a lot of earthquakes, they experience tsunamis, and they experience wildfires. So they see how fragile and delicate life is and how it can be taken from you at any moment and how it's best to just surrender yourself to that. It's, it's outside of your hands, it's out of your control. Then we get to see a scene with Omi and our girl Kiku. The man is fully and utterly in love with her, as he should be. But unfortunately, he is doing that shit that we we constantly see him doing, which is running his mouth. And so he's running his mouth to Kiku. And like, come on now. If I'm going to be a courtesan, I'm trying to be the courtesan up in Osaka Castle, baby. I'm not trying to be a little Ajiro. Uh, so while he's telling her all his problems, and she has her motives, as she should, because she's a queen, as she should. And we, we stand an ambitious queen over here. We stand an ambitious queen over at Zodicor. But he's explaining to her his little dilemma. And then of course, she's got to slip her little 
motives in there. And she says to him all just sweetly and just bashfully. <laughs> I wish you were our Lord. I bet you do. I bet you. I bet you want to be laid up with the Lord. I see you, Kiku. And you know, Omi is high off of that. He's high off of that. Okay. She just took his soul. And now she's talking about, oh, I wish you were our Lord. Like, that's not going to send that boy into a tailspin. She know what she's doing. She know what she, she know her influence. She ain't get that title for no reason. We know how she got that title she got. So then we have Ishido's men popping up, breaking protocol once again. We see Josen. I think that's how you say that man's name. I don't know. But we see this man, Josen. He goes to Yabushige and he lets him know you have been requested at the castle. They want you to pledge your allegiance to the council and accept the consequences for your actions. We all know Yabushige is a survivor. He's not trying to hear none of that. Okay. Yabushige is going to play the game. He is going to snake and weasel his way out of a situation. So his way out is by explaining to Josen, hey, look, I'm trying to train these men. And if something happens to Toronaga, I, I can bring this to Ishido. Like, come on, let me do this. We are going to war. Like, there is going to be a war. And trust me, Ishido is going to want me as an asset. He suggests that they spend the night. And come back in the morning because their men are done training right now. But come back in the morning and I'll show you what we've been up to. Trust me, you're going to want to get in on this. Back at Blackthorn's place, they're having dinner. And Blackthorn wants to offer Fuji a gun as a gift. Fuji is looking at the gun and she's like, what can I even do with this? Blackthorn says at his mouth, I will train you on how to use this and you will be the most fearsome woman in all the Japans. He is giving this to her so that she can protect herself. I don't know why Mariko doesn't translate that that way to her. I don't know if it would have made a difference, but I mean, I kind of do because the way Mariko translates it to Fuji is she tells her it's so that you can protect him. And Fuji's response is, I, I would rather pull a gourd from a horse. Like, why would I want to? I don't know why Mariko translated it that way. I think maybe if she had translated it the way that he meant it, maybe Fuji would have taken it a little bit different. But who, who knows? Maybe she wouldn't have liked the gift regardless. And then Fuji goes to her room and she brings out her father's swords to give to Blackthorn. Blackthorn is incredibly touched, but he does not want to take these swords. He's like, there's no way, like, these are your family heirlooms that I'm just subdued that you're being forced to, you know, be a consort for. Like, no, this is, no, I cannot take this. But they point out to him that with his title it's not proper for him to walk around without any swords and it would be disrespectful for her to be the consort to a man who has no swords so he ends up taking them he's very thankful for the gift i don't know i i think he and fuji if fuji spoke if they spoke the same language i think him and fuji would have like a good friendship because i think fuji would have poisoned him in his sleep but I think the fact that he is not forcing himself on her, I think she's like, oh, okay, maybe he's all right. Thank God. Thank God this man don't want no parts of me, Lord. <laughs> Thank you. In the next scene, we see Omi and Nagakado discussing what they can do to prevent Ishido's men from seeing their secret weapons. Romi makes the suggestion that Nagakado said word to his father. But Nagakado, and I think Omi is aware of this, but Nagakado is a spoiled little brat and he desperately wants to prove that he's not. And he's going through one of those phases where it's like, I'm a big boy. What am I? What am I? I do what I want. He's having one of those. He's having one of those moments. 
this is the phase of life that he's in. He doesn't want to have to go right into his daddy. He wants people to respect him. And Omi knows that and is playing on that. He's definitely planting a seed in Nagakado because he doesn't want to be held responsible. He definitely does not want Ishido's men to see their weapons, but he can't be responsible for stopping them. So he plants the seed in Nagakado. Nagakado ends up saying to Omi, look, don't contact my father. I'm going to handle this. Young man, young man, young man, how are you going to handle this? How are you going to handle this? So then we surprisingly catch Blackthorn looking for a hot spring to take a bath in, really turning him into a civilized chap. Mariko finds him and they end up having a very vulnerable moment. It was very sweet. It was not romantic. I I understand. Like again, I didn't read the book, so I don't know. But I, I the general theme that I picked up is people think that these two are going to end up together, and I'm like, maybe they're going to change the story a little bit because I haven't seen any romantic tension. I haven't seen any romantic tension between these two people. They have not interacted in any way that makes me feel like one is attracted to the other one. Okay. Maybe Blackthorn because she's pretty, but I mean, again, there's I I haven't seen it. I have not seen it. Is the chemistry is not there for me? Um, in this moment, I could tell that they were trying to like have like this vulnerability moment, and it 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 read like it did a good job. Like I could sense the like I could sense the chemistry there, but it wasn't a romantic chemistry. It was a friendly, I trust you. And I feel like I can open up to you in this moment. But anyway, so Mariko partially explains her true motives for serving Toronaga. She doesn't say much. She just tells Blackthorn that he's wrong about his assumptions on why she's serving. We see some flashbacks of her father, but again, it doesn't paint a full picture. She just lets him know that it has to do with an injustice that she suffered. She mentions that for a long time she couldn't figure out a solution and that Toronaga recently offered her a solution. Mariko asks him where he's from and he tells her he's from London. They have this cute little moment of him telling her what they would do if she were to come from Japan to London, if they would have a night out. He claims the queen would receive them. I don't believe it. I guess you could say that was romantic, but again, it came out of nowhere. Like, it just came out of nowhere. Why would you guys be going on a date in London? Whatever. So back at Blackthorn's place, we see him drifting off to sleep and Fuji, like, tucking him in like his mom. <laughs> she says goodnight to him and we see her leave the room and then we see him get a sneaky little visitor in the form of Mariko. She sneaks into this man's room and accosts this man in his sleep. He was sleeping. She woke him up. It was jarring. She sneaks into his room. He's confused until she puts his hand on her titty and then he's a clear sounded mind. Okay. You know, they do what adults do. Again, no buildup for me there. There was just no... Did not see that coming. It was so random to me. It was so random to me. I, I, I saw no signs that that woman would be motivated to sneak into this man's room at night and take him down. There just was no sexual tension there for me. But whatever. If you told me she just needed to get her rocks off, okay then okay, I could see that. But it didn't give she desired this man and she was longing for this man. But they made it happen. And then the next morning at breakfast with Fuji and Mariko, Blackthorn thought it was proper to like talk about him and Mariko getting it on last night. And Mariko like shuts him down like, okay, so... 
the courtesan we sent you last night was up to your liking. I'm so happy for you. Like, and he's like looking at her show like, well, I don't, I don't get it. You think I'm about to talk about smashing you right now? You think that's normal? Like, is that what the English do? Y'all just did, <laughs> me or her smashed last night. Like, is that how you talk? That's how you act? No, this is a secret. Shut up. We sent you somebody else. That wasn't my coochie. That was some other chick's coochie, sir. Please, calm down. You're a little too intoxicated for me. Like, are you in love with me or something? Calm down, because I'm not in love with you. So, back at the training grounds, Yabushige's men are getting ready to show Ishido's men these amazing cannons and what they're capable of. But then... This episode gave me so much anxiety, I cannot even. So, <laughs> Nagakato postures towards Josen and starts shouting at him and lets him know, look, your presence here is offensive to my father and I demand compensation. Everyone is totally confused. Okay, nobody knows what this boy is up to. Nagakato then signals for his men to fire cannons at Ishido's men. He just blows up all of these men as Josen, lie dying, just blown to bits. He says, this is not how samurai fight. You're all savages. Nagakato could care less. He approaches him and slices his head off. Yabushige is besides himself. But Omi is standing next to him. He got spies. He's so happy his plan worked. Blackthorn and Mariko are in complete utter shock. And they are rightly terrified of what this means going forward. They know that nothing good is going to come. It is war. And that, unfortunately, is how episode four comes to an end. I don't know. I'm out here sounding crazy. Oh, I'm so sorry, y'all. They got me. My throat. My throat was killing me, child. Oh, man. I still can't breathe out my nose. I've been just eating soup and drinking tea, trying to feel better. Oh, we got to watch the trailer. We got to watch the trailer for episode five. Let's get this going. Let's get this trailer up. We see together. From this day forward, the only words we share will be from others' lips. I ask that my ship and my men be returned to me so that I may leave and not return. Tuesday. FX's Shogun, all new Tuesdays, stream on Hulu. What does that mean? What does that mean? That last little scene with uh, with Lady Ochiba? What does that mean? I hope she's getting ready to kill him. That's my hope. I'm like, the only way she would get away with talking to that man like that is if she was just getting ready to kill him. Or if she's getting ready to get him to do her bidding. Like she's about to proposition him with something. And I hope not. I mean, I don't know. I don't really have a side because they're all just scratching and surviving. I'm definitely anti them people coming up in there. But as far as like the Toranaga Ishido thing, they're all just fighting for their place. But what do you think is happening? Does anybody have any predictions for episode five? I told y'all Fuji has some in her and we finally got to see a little spark of it in episode four. Y'all let me know who some of you guys' favorite characters are and why. You gotta let me know why you love them so much. And what do you guys think about Blackthorn and Mariko's romance? And if you read the book or watched the first series, you have a completely different perspective. 
So if you're someone who's just watching it, just the FX one, I would love to hear you guys' perspective. And let me know if you guys saw the romance building, because I did not. I knew that they were going to end up together, but I didn't see it happening that quickly. Like, I felt like that moment at the hot spring was like the first introduction to maybe something romantic going on but then they immediately just jumped into having sex after that and i was like mm. but yeah your girl is sick my throat hurt y'all so i don't have too much to say but i needed to get this out but now we're totally caught up the episodes air on mondays i plan on getting them out by wednesdays and let me know do you guys like the morning premieres because i usually premiere them at 10 o'clock in the morning and then i tried to do it a 1 30 premiere but all the other ones have been around have been at 10. so let me know if you guys like that let me know if there's a particular time that works best for you guys thank you guys so much for watching this video make sure you like comment and subscribe turn on that notification bell so you know when the next video is out and i will see you guys in the next one bye Don't you feel